Hi, this is Joseph Langley, and I'm here with, what's your name? James Emmanuel. James Emmanuel. And what do you do, Mr. Emmanuel? What do I do? I write. You write? Mm hmm What do you write? Things I'm thinking about. Okay, you write your thoughts. Have yeah. you written any books? Yes, I've written quite, quite a few books. Really? Yeah. What are they called? One on Ice and Hughes. Uh-huh. One is uh, an anthology that changed the publishing scene uh -huh. for black people, called Dark Symphony. Okay. Negro, the, day, the word Negro was used mm -hmm. in 1968 when that was published, Negro Literature in America. Okay. And books. I published... Fourteen? Fourteen books of poetry. Fourteen books? Mm -hmm. Of poetry. That's just poetry. Just My poetry, poetry only. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow, so you've written a lot. Yeah. My bones tell me that. You can feel it in your bones. Yeah. I wrote a poem like that once. I said, something good is going to happen. I can feel it in my bones. Mm -hmm. so Did can, you feel it? I feel it. I can tell. So tell me about your book on Langston Hughes. What did you talk about? His life? Yeah, his life and works. <clears throat> he told me, he said, you know more about my poems than I do. Mm -hmm. Or was that short st stories? Because I had written my doctoral dissertation on his stories. I think it was the first one in the United States, that first doctoral dissertation on a black writer, and only one of the literary forms that he used, his mm -hmm. short stories. Okay. Now, what else? I might think of some more later, and I'll, then I'll give you some kind of signal. Books, books. Okay, let's talk about Dark Symphony. So mm -hmm. you said that that book changed the publishing world. How did it change the publishing oh, world? Oh, in this way. The publishing industry in the United States hadn't published any black anthologies like it for 40 years, a long time. Mm -hmm. Negro Caravan. Negro Caravan. Is that another yeah. book? No, that was a book written and edited by two or three black men, mostly teachers, mm -hmm. and it changed the whole scene because the publishing industry hadn't encouraged or accepted any manuscript like that before. Okay, so it was a revolution. It was a, a book written by a pioneer. You might say that. Yeah. So you're a pioneer. Yeah. Why are you a pioneer? Because I do things that have never been done before. Okay, that's what I thought you were going to say. Like, <laughs> what else did you do that has never been done before? Well, I invented a new form of literature mm -hmm. called the jazz and blues haiku. Jazz and blues haiku. Mm -hmm. What's haiku? A haiku is a Japanese form. Mm-hmm that I borrowed and used in a different way. A Japanese form of what? Of poetry. A poetry. Good, poetry. I'm glad you okay. brought that out of me. It uh, has three lines. The first has seven syllables. Mm -hmm. Five syllables. First has five syllables. The second line has seven syllables, and the third line has five syllables. You got 17 syllables. Mm -hmm. That's all you got to make a poem. Okay. So it's, I picked it, I created it because it's difficult to do. Mm -hmm. Make a whole poem with only 17 syllables. And so you have to be rigorous in, in respecting that form when you write a haiku. You, if, you, if you call yourself a good poet, yeah. Okay. If you're willing to be mediocre, <laughs> you, you can, can cheat. Kind of do what you want. You can play around. Okay, but if you're, if you're an integrist in poetry, you have to stick to that formula. Yeah, if you are writing haiku, Mm -hmm. You ought to write what a haiku is. Exactly. Rather than something else and just say it's a haiku. Okay. Yeah. That's a temptation, I guess. Now, you said jazz haiku. Haiku, excuse mm -hmm. me. How, now, what's the difference between jazz haiku and haiku? Oh, that's like what's the difference between jazz and other music? <laughs> I can sit here for a long time without saying what that is, I guess. What was your question? What's the difference between jazz haiku 
and haiku? Well, a jazz haiku, <clears throat> which didn't exist before I made it up, uh -huh. uh, has a different purpose. Mm -hmm. I use it to, with bad, uh, jazz as a basis, mm -hmm. but I use it also said an advertisement from my publisher to say about all the things that a black American would say. Mm -hmm. That it contains much, or almost all, of the basic things in <clears throat> African American life. Okay, so you chose African American life as a subject for your haiku. Or it chose me. It chose you. Yeah. Is that what makes it jazzy? You mean it's choosing me? Yes. Maybe. If I feel jazzy. Okay. <laughs> Do you incorporate music with your, your poetry? Uh, you might say other people do. Uh -huh. Or I have read in different countries with a <clears throat> jazz saxophonist, mm -hmm. African American chant seven, to back up what I'm doing. Uh -huh. And we're playing it together. Okay. You know, when he's supposed to come in with his sax, when he's supposed to go out, so forth. Okay, and when the music plays, does it respect the same, the same uh, structure as the reading of the poem? For example, in the music, there's measures and beats. Is it seven mm -hmm. beats and five beats every time that you have uh, something to say? Or is it more free? It's a little freer than that. I hadn't checked it out in the, in the precise way that you stated. Uh -huh. I'll try that one of these Yeah, days. see, I'm just thinking here. I'm being, because I write a little bit of poetry myself. But oh, I'm, fine. I'm doing more sonnets. Sonnets? Know. Yeah. I wrote, I published a few sonnets. Okay, let's talk about your poetry. Can you mm -hmm. tell me uh, what makes you write poetry? What inspires you to write poetry? I guess when I was a kid, I, I heard some lines of poetry. Birds. The poem showed birds being blown by the wind through the sky. And I had seen that scene mm -hmm. many times. So I knew without thinking in these words that the poem was real. And I'd like I like I knew I'd like to do something like that. It was beautiful and at the same time grabbed something inside of you. <clears throat> I was, uh, one thing important to me in poetry, <clears throat> when I was near the end of my time in high school, I wrote a poem. <clears throat> in high school, junior high. Mm -hmm. Because the, the woman who directed the junior high school, we called her Miss Wilson. I remember that her skirts flash when she walked. Oh, it kind of flowed with the wind. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, she chose me to read my poem mm -hmm. on the stage mm -hmm. in front of all these people in the audience. And I did that, but I felt bad. And I said to myself, I'll never again write another poem if this is what's going to happen as a result. I'll have to stand up in front of all these people looking at me, all of them at the same time. This I just, this dumbfounded me. I said, I don't like that. I guess you're very humble then. Uh, at the right times, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, can be, I can be different. <laughs> yeah. And where'd you go to school at? Oh, uh, what level? All levels. Where'd you begin? Uh, I started in Alliance, Nebraska. Uh huh. That's where I was born in Alliance, Nebraska. Where's Alliance. that? What's that near? Because that's a city that that's no one knows. That's not far from Cheyenne, Wyoming. Not far from Denver, Colorado. Okay, so you're in the, the Midwest. Uh, closer to the Wild West. The Wild yeah. West. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I see many cowboys, including black cowboys and Indians, mm -hmm. on the street. Real Indians, not, not. Uh, drugstore, well, drugstore comes closer to it. Mm -hmm. And an Indian, <clears throat> my enemy on the basketball court, 
was a real Indian. His name was Gray Bear. Gray Bear. And he could sink a shot almost from the middle of the court. And he would go through the basket. <laughs> and, of course, he was my enemy. But I respected his ability. He was also your friend. Well, uh, he was... He didn't live around me. Uh huh. He was from Pine Ridge. They had an Indian reservation. Mm -hmm. Well, the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, and we played their base, their uh, basketball, and track team. Yeah. Mm hmm. But that's about it. Okay, that was in high school then. That was in uh, high school. Yeah. In the Lions. Uh, yes. Okay, and then from there, where'd you go to school? In Washington D.C. Okay. Howard University. To Howard? Mm -hmm. That's a good school. Yes, it is. I've never met teachers as good as they were mm -hmm. since I left uh, that part of the country. And what did you study when you were at Howard? Mm, my minor, no, my major was English, mm -hmm. English literature. My minor was psychology. <coughs> Mm -hmm. I thought if you're going to be a writer, you ought to know some special things about people. Yeah, you have to be able to describe people and you have to be able to like look at them and get an idea of their character. Yeah, and look at them from the inside, from their inside. Okay, to be able to... Which would mean from your inside to their inside. You project on them what you see in them. If I wanted to. <laughs> if you wanted to. <laughs> I might feel something I wouldn't want to project on them. Okay, the day we're sitting here in your home in Paris. Now tell me something. Um, how do you get from Alliance to Howard to Paris? By train. By train? <laughs> <laughs> well, the Bering Strait has, has melted, so you got to get on a plane or a boat sooner or later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Oh, I know how I got... Uh... No, no. I went to Howard... After I came out of the army, because mm -hmm. I had lived there before, and I knew some people, buddies, and a few girls. Mm -hmm. So that's why I went to Washington. And I had a respect for the staff there, mm -hmm. despite what the country as a whole thinks about you know what. But I, after Howard, ah, yeah. I used to work in the War Department as a private or confidential secretary mm -hmm. of General Davis, who was the first black general in the Army. Okay. I think they picked me because I was from the West and that maybe I wouldn't cause them trouble about civil rights. Mm -hmm. That's my idea, you know, because people try to figure out things yeah. about you. And, uh, <clears throat> One officer was named Mott, Colonel Mott, in the, in the office of the Inspector General, that's, mm -hmm. that's the type. And he talked to me, and he advised me to, interestingly, what he, the way he did it. He was going to advise me where to go to college. Mm -hmm. And he said, for your master's degree, no, no, for your baccalaureate degree, go to a black university. Mm -hmm. And then he said, for your master's, go to a mostly white university. Mm -hmm. He had done something like that. The, uh, uh, what? What is the university uh, thinking about? So here's where my, my memory slips on me once in a while. Like Harvard or Yale or Princeton? No, no. Uh -huh. The mail, it was in... Uh, MIT? No. In uh, Massachusetts. It wasn't there, it was above there. It's just funny that this is the first time I forgot the name of that university. Was it Bates? And the thing is this. He said, for your master's, go to this university. Mm -hmm. You stop there. 
He didn't say, for your PhD, do this, because he couldn't imagine me Going having further. the same degree he had. Mm -hmm. You see? I see. Well, that, that's, that was my feeling about it. And that was long ago. My feeling hasn't changed yet about why he didn't continue. Because uh, this university that I went to is going to come back to me after you leave, of course. <laughs> <clears throat> it wanted me to stay. He said, the, the head of the English department said, I think you would do very well here. Mm -hmm. But I thought I wanted to go to the most challenging place. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was New York. Like mm -hmm. the song said, if you can make it here, you, you can, can make, make it, it anywhere. anywhere. That's where I wanted to make it. And you're still in Paris today, so how'd you get to Paris? Lots of black people wanted to go to Paris. Uh-huh. Did you want to come to Paris, or did you just happen to come here by chance? No, happened. I couldn't afford to do any of those things by chance. <laughs> or just happened to. <clears throat> people wanted, uh, black people, a lot of people wanted to go to France. They would quote the poem, uh, my county colors about France. Mm -hmm. In this poem, he wanted to die an old Parisian, so mm -hmm. forth. And uh, I shouldn't <clears throat> admit the next thing I'm going to say. <clears throat> I wanted to go to Paris because even as a child, I had read. Okay. I'd read of the nice ladies there, <laughs> and I wanted to see them. Did you want to see the girls dancing in Pigalle? Pigalle, I didn't, oh, I learned about it, oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> I learned about it. Before winter I learned about it, yeah. So and I uh, never changed my mind, although this is a subject we might or might not get to. I think that there is a group of black people who don't want black writers to go outside the United States and mm -hmm. live and teach. They think they should stay with, quote, their own people, mm -hmm. not go traipsing off so far away. Okay. And you said you were in the Army. What did you do in the Army? Well, I did what all soldiers do. One interesting thing I think about when I think of my time in the Army. I was put in a boot camp in Massachusetts. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and in that camp, they decided, or somebody higher up decided, to give tests to all the new soldiers. Mm -hmm in this Massachusetts camp to see who was fit to go to officer training school to mm -hmm. become an army officer. Now, <clears throat> they gave me the test. They gave everybody in the camp, the fort, the test. And I learned through the captain covering, or oh, we're in charge of us new soldiers, Captain Richard Kane, K-A-N-E. Uh -huh. He was from New York. And he told me, you got the highest score in the whole regiment. So you're going to be trained as an officer. And he said, I'm very proud of you. You know what happened to me? What? They didn't send me to officer training. They sent me to an ordnance ammunition company in the Philippine Islands where I worked cutting down trees uh -huh. stuff like that. You know, these incidents like that mounted up in my life mm -hmm. one by one by one until gradually it hit me that I was always going to be, in the minds of many people, different. Do you think that you are too intelligent? 
How it just for the people wrong, to handle? Wrong race. You think you really had a problem in your life with uh, the fact that you were a black man? Oh, yes indeed. Like, oh, I don't see how you can live to be an adult and be black without having a lot of trouble uh -huh. in the United States. Particular kind of trouble. I don't. I never met of or heard of anyone who was unscathed in that way. Do you feel that with the new president, Mr. Obama, that things are changing? Yeah, they have to change because just the idea of thinking our president and thinking of a black man this is revolutionary mm -hmm. in the minds of most people. So it can't help but affect. Is this something that you've been waiting for? No, I wasn't waiting. You weren't waiting? No. You didn't that think is, it would happen? Uh, that is to say, I know you just used a phrase there, mm -hmm. but I don't wait. When I know something uh, that's good, I try to, I know it will find a way into my life, because it mm -hmm. always has. I'm going to cross my fingers. It's gonna, the good is going to come. And I'm going to be strong enough to fight it, because mm -hmm. I know. And so I don't dodge and run and do those uh, genuflecting things. Okay. Let's talk about your other books. What other books have you written? Well, there are books of poetry. Mm-hmm. There are 14 of them. 14? Are they all haiku? Oh, no. No. Because I didn't start writing, I didn't make up haiku until about 1990, 92. Mm -hmm. So before I wrote a few sonnets, mm -hmm. and I wrote, well, free verse. That is, I, I tried to make, in each case, the nature of the poem to be mm -hmm. pick its own form. That is, I always started with free verse. Mm -hmm. Just let it... Be Let it flow. It's going to be, yeah. Let it go. Can you give us a, an example of one of your poems? You mean read one or just read try? one if you want to? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can. I can get one here. Okay. Glasses. Okay. So have to make up something as I go. <laughs> <laughs> You're like me. Yeah. I can't see with my glasses. I can't see without them. <laughs> oh. Well, that sends you into another area. <laughs> is this a book that you've written all of only your poetry? This is my latest book. Okay, it what's has, it called? It has... Uh, the Force it and the Reckoning. The Force and the Reckoning. James A. Manuel. And it has my autobiography. This title suggests that my young life gave me the force. Mm -hmm. And that the poems, you know, a reckoning for a farmer, mm -hmm. and I know a lot about farmers, is the crop. Mm -hmm. He looks and he figures how many bushels to the air, to the What now? He's going to get, and I, I know a lot about that. I, I've been in a rodeo. Mm -hmm. You've been a cowboy? Yeah. You've been a cowboy? Yeah, oh yeah. So you've done a lot of things. You've really lived the life of a poet. <laughs> you might say that, yeah. Yeah. Sounds so like I, Lord, uh, Lord Byron to me here in front of me, the black Lord Byron. Well, that's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if I can get it with me. You want a kind of a simple poem, I guess. I knew a girl, little girl, mm -hmm. in uh, not far from Toulouse, mm -hmm. who started me to writing poetry again. Mm -hmm. Her name was Alix. I have a picture in one of my books. And she was reading from her picture book, mm -hmm. and she would read something like a, something like a dog, and she'd look up at me, and she'd want me to say something. But I'd say a dog, but I didn't know much French. Didn't know much. I didn't know much French then. Don't know much now. 
But finally she looked at me on the page. She said, Key, 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 K-E-Y, Key. Mm -hmm. And I said, she's giving me the key. And after that, I could write. Here's a poem I made for her later. Mm -hmm. She told everybody I was her poet. This is my poet. So she came to me and said, put me on poem. You make a poem for me. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote a poem called Wishes for Alix. And sometimes I ask, we'll ask an audience, what wish is there here that can come true? And what is the one that cannot come true? Wishes for Alix. Always searching, may you find. If you run down, may you whine. Every year may you grow, reaping only what you sow. Sowing only in the seed, what will ripen into need, what will sweeten to the touch, seeming little, being much. May your playmates be a song. May your friends just skip along, laughing you into their game. Letting you remain the same in their hearts and on their lips, even when their fingertips have to let you go your way. Glad they saw Alix today. Simple poem. Simple poem, but beautiful poem. Thank you. Can we have one more? Uh, Please. Let me see. I'll give you another one. I'm born about young folks. Called The Young One's Flip Side. In tight pants, tight skirts, stretched or squeezed, youth hurts. Crammed in, bursting out, flesh will sing and hide its doubt. In nervous hips, hopping glance, usurping rouge, provoking stance. Put off or put on. Youth hurts and then is gone. Once again, a beautiful moment. Thank you. One girl told me, I think by this poem, she said, you have a really good poem. <laughs> she was about 13, 14 years old. She liked that. Do you speak French? No. No? No. How do you when live in I Paris? Can, oh, I can so say a few things, of <laughs> But uh, I had to choose between, see, my mind rebels if I do the wrong things with it. Yeah. And you know, to learn a language, you do certain things with your mind. And yeah. You've got to do those things. Otherwise. i say, you know, no. So what I did, I knew I had to either write at that moment, write or learn uh, poetry mm -hmm. or learn French. I, I had no real choice. I'm a writer. Yeah, yeah, so you're a writer, you're a poet, yeah. Yeah. you were a cowboy, you were a soldier, yeah. you were a student. Mm -hmm. What else did you do? What else do you do? No, oh, now, of course, I don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Very few of them makes it right. But they all uh, played, in, played important stages in my life. Mm -hmm. did, you have, did you have any other career turns, any other things you did in your life? Something that you know, a lot of times you do stuff you don't think oh, about it because yeah, it's normal. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Where was I? Oh yeah, once in uh, Chicago. Uh huh. I just graduated, so I'm become Lodi. Uh huh. And left Washington to go to Chicago. Oh, I yeah. I knew a girl there. Yeah. In Chicago. 
get me off, get me off the track. <laughs> no, 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 we don't want you to tell that story. I just wanted you to tell me what, what were the different jobs that you, oh, were, yeah. that you did. In Chicago, I, I wanted a job. And so he was a young man at the time. He was doing the hiring. You have to go up to him, uh -huh. tell him a little things, and he'd either hire you or not. Uh -huh. Quite, quite a young man, of course. <clears throat> and I told him I just graduated from the cum laude, I'm looking for work. Now, the work he had was shoveling coal. Uh huh. Just shoveling coal. Yeah. But he didn't hire me for that. But I was walking away. And he called me back and he said, uh, I just wanted to tell you I couldn't hire you because you're black and there were tears in his eyes. Uh-huh. So you were almost a coal shoveler. Almost. <laughs> I shoveled coal when I was a kid but not for money. Okay. There's something else I wanted to uh, about funny job. Oh yeah. Yeah, I was living in Denver, where a lot of my family lived for some time. They're all gone now, all dead. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and I had to leave, uh, I had a friend from this old CCC, oh, I got too much, I can't tell you very little. <laughs> too many things to tell. Okay, don't I, tell. I, I, I went into, I was in a CCC camp in Kansas for two years. What's a CCC? Civilian Conservation Corps. Uh -huh. It was uh, envisaged by the president, who was Franklin D. Roosevelt. Uh -huh. And if you were poor, you had a better chance of getting into a CCC camp. And they would send your salary, most of your salary home to your parents. Or mm -hmm this mother in my case. And that's it. You kept $8. Mm -hmm. So you had $8 a month. And the $22 went was home. Sent, sent home. And I chose to re-enlist for one year. So I spent two years there. Third year, and I had a buddy who was, uh, what, where was he? Was in the medical department? Or, I forget what, Fry. Is what we call him Fry. He went with me to the bus station. I was leaving. I said, Fry, I remember talking to him. I said, if you want to do something in this step in life, you got to take a giant step. You got to take a giant I, step. I said, I'm taking a giant step now because I had nothing. Nothing. Uh -huh. I got on the bus, well, almost nothing. The driver asked me where I was going, of course. And I said, I pulled up. I had two dollars and fifty-two cents, I think. And I showed it to him, and I said, where will this take me? He said, that'll take you to Davenport, Iowa. Uh -huh. I said, well, I'm going to Davenport, Iowa. So you took a giant step, took a leap of faith. Yeah. You didn't know what was waiting for you? I didn't know. And you didn't I, know when that? When I got there, I, was, I had a suitcase so old that, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, this fella, it fell apart on the sidewalk, but that's minor in comparison to other things that happened to me. I got up to the street door and I was just walking towards the town. I didn't know what town it was. And there was a bridge. This was right on the Mississippi River. Uh huh. And I thought I'd cross over the bridge and see what it was I could get a job in this town. And I went to the man who collected the tolls. <clears throat> and, he, and he said, no. I said, well, how much does it cost to cross the bridge? He said, five cents. Five cents. I said, well, I don't, I don't have five cents. And he said, well, that next big bridge down there is free. And so I went toward that next bridge, and I crossed into a town called East. Moline, and they had nothing, said they had nothing. By the way, when I first left home on this trip, mm -hmm. uh, I asked a man for a job, remind me to come back to where I was, I asked a man for a job, uh -huh. and I had just 
was in my last year of high school, and I took shorthand and typing, because uh -huh. I figured boys wouldn't know much about shorthand, so I would have an edge on them. Uh -huh. And I found that I won first place uh -huh. in the district contest, many towns in the same district, and I won, se I won second place in the state contest, in the whole state. Uh -huh. I was number two. Uh -huh. So I knew I was going to get a job as a secretary. Yeah. <clears throat> and so I, I left home. My mother said, always put your best foot forward. Uh-huh. <clears throat> you did. I did. So coming back to the story, you crossed I've, the bridge. I want to finish this. Story. Okay. <laughs> I asked the man for a job in our office of some kind, and he laughed in my face. I started to, you know, I started to cloud him one. <laughs> yeah, you're ready to punch him out. I thought that would be foolish. He laughed. <laughs> and that taught me something. Now, you asked me a question. Do you want something you want me to say or talk about? Yes, I wanted to know, did you do any other, other career moves besides a soldier, a writer, a poet? What else did you do? And that's where we got to the well, conversation. Well, this, this, of course, I... I, uh, coming you almost were a coal back. shoveler, and then you weren't. And then I, I saw a big place down under the bridge. I was going to go back to Davenport because I in defeat, temporary defeat. Uh huh. So I said I went down there. It's a junkyard. That's what it was. Uh huh. So I went <laughs> went in the front door. You know. And I told him, man, I was looking for a job. There were two there, the owners, that turned out, Brady. Uh -huh. It was Brady Iron and Metal Company. Uh -huh. A name for a junkyard. And he said, uh, he looked at me, he said, what can you do? I said, I can do anything. He looked at me again. Well, come back tomorrow morning. And I come back tomorrow morning, that's how I started working in the junkyard. Now, I, I, I took civil service tests. Uh -huh. You know those tests, I guess. And you get a score, uh -huh. and they send you to some big place in Washington to find out where to put you. Yeah. I had taken civil service tests before, and I would always, but... Uh, I'd get veterans' preference of five points. Uh -huh. So I would always get scores like 93, 94, but they didn't give me a job. Uh -huh. And suddenly, they gave me a job to go to Washington. Uh -huh. And I went to, I went to Washington. And there was a pool of people. I think quite a few of them were black. Mm -hmm. And I was beginning to understand. I'd never seen a whole lot of black people, by the way, before. Never. Uh, together. I went to the CC camp. Never. Uh -huh. Oh, no, never. Anyhow, <clears throat> okay, that's on the job. I don't think I did anything else that I can remember now. Well, I think you've inspired a lot of people, and you will inspire a lot of people. Yeah, I now I always get medals from students. Uh huh. This is a, a group that came here from New York, from Syracuse, New York. Uh -huh. They're doing summer studies here. There was and a school in New York, Syracuse, C.W. Post College. I, I read once there in the nurse, the people told me women, were they nurses? You shouldn't read a poem like that, they said. And I have very seldom read it. Well, it sounds like you've had a poet's life. You had your back, your sack on your back, and you were walking around, and you were just discovering life and discovering new places, yeah, and discovering people. Also, I was, I was very strong. I don't know why. I could take a Coca-Cola bottle cap and bend it between With the my hands. fingers. See? Uh -huh. I don't know why. Maybe somebody knew I was going to need that. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've had a beautiful life. And it's been a beautiful moment just talking with you. Well, I'm glad you think of it that way. Yeah. And if you had some advice to give to someone younger one day, someone coming up, 
like you and who wanted to just do something and didn't know where to start, what would you tell them? Well, if you're looking for a job, I would suggest that he look for the kind of job that he wants uh -huh. until he finds it. You might have to take something else before you hit that mm -hmm. job. And then, always trust yourself. Always trust yourself so that you don't have to blame somebody else for what you just couldn't do. Always trust yourself. And then you can make it. Thank you. You're welcome.